who's from the African region, and she will be uh, addressing and highlighting some illustrations of enhanced cooperation. So, Nena. Hi, people. Did we agree I was going to speak first? Oh, my goodness. All right. OK, I think Salah got me. Um, I promised I'll be speaking on one or two things. I recall in Dubai during the World uh, Conference on International Telecommunications, somebody said, why do we need to define a two-letter word, enhanced cooperation? So I will ask you that question. Why do you need to define enhanced cooperation and what would you get out of it? But this session we are talking about the need for coordination and I'm speaking coming from Africa. My national IGF, it's Côte d'Ivoire IGF, Initiative de Gouvernance de l'Internet en Côte d'Ivoire, that's in French, Ivory Coast. Then I'm also part of the West Africa IGF. West Africa is the western part of Africa, made up of 15 countries. And I'm also part of the Africa IGF, which is the continental, or we can say the regional forum in Africa. Well, as we move through the national, the sub-regional, and the regional, there are different models of coordination in the Côte d'Ivoire IGF, we have a president and a national forum with a secretariat. And they are more, they are really operational. They do, they have actions, they go to places, they do trainings. And that is one reason why we are saying that IGF is best at its, its national level. Actually, there's a number you can call and someone will pick up that number at national level. When you come to the West Africa level, now things get a bit complicated because in West Africa alone, we have three official languages. We speak English, we speak French, and we speak Portuguese. And so it is a challenge to be able to coordinate 15 countries that are a third of a billion. Actually, West Africa is 350 million in population now. At that level, the coordination is done by a consortium of different stakeholders. And that is a model we may want to discuss later on here. And the consortium is led by the Free Software and Open Source Foundation for Africa. And there are discussions ongoing to see if we need a full secretariat. But for the moment, what West Africa IGF has is a consortium leading it, a consortium of seven organizations. At the Africa level, we have a secretariat. That not an, a staffed operational secretariat. We just know that the Secretariat is lodged at the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, and it has been supported by the AU Commission, by the African Union Commission. Now, how does this play out in reality? All of that I've said are institutional arrangements, but we still know that it is individuals that make things happen. So what happens is that at every level, you will notice that someone is the person who takes care of it. So in as much as we have this institutional arrangement, it still boils down to people. Africa has been blessed to be almost one block of land that makes up the continent and a few islands. And that really makes things easier. And for those who do not know, the African Union, that used to be the Organization of African Unity, is one of the oldest well, multilateral government organizations that exists. And this has helped 
the AU to have Africa subdivided in sub-regions. And you find out that in Africa, the sub-regional IGF follow the same sub-regional developer classification of the continent. Now, for each of these, we still have sub-regional economic commissions. So for West Africa, we have the Economic Commission of West African States. And that is like the international interstate organization that we liaise with. For Southern Africa, we have SADC. For Central Africa, we have another organization. And for Northern Africa, we have another organization. So the way Africa is structured allows for coordination. It allows for interaction and institutional multi-stakeholder partnerships. Let me end here by talking to you about what we call the AF stars. It, is, it begins with an A, an F, and a wild card. What are AF stars? AF stars in the framework of internet governance refers to all the Africa organizations that are working and collaborating together. The first AF star, you know it. It's called Afrenic. So you do an AF and you add Renic. And you know that is the Nick for Africa. The second AF star is AFNOG. That is the Network Operators Group. Then there is African, which is the Africa Icon Group. Then there is Af. A IGF, of course, that you know, which is the Africa Internet Governance Forum. There is FLTD, which is the Africa um, LTD well, Regional Organization. There is AFNIC, which is the Association for National uh, NIC at the national level. There is AFRISIC which is the Africa School of Internet Governance. And there is Af AFICTA, which is the Africa ICT Alliance, and a whole lot of AFSTARS coming up. So all of these come together in many circles. So you have about the same actors, technical, um, academic, civil society, uh, international organizations around the AF stars. And it was wonderful for us to have met in Zambia earlier this year in the Africa Internet Summit, which was co-organized by all the AF stars. So as we live here, I would like you to note that the next Africa Internet Summit, AIS or Africa whatever you want to call it, will be happening in Djibouti. We are taking it to places you've not heard of. And while the Djibouti guy was making his presentation and inviting us to Djibouti next year for Africa Internet Summit, he did make something very important. He said that in Djibouti, you have a place called the Devil's Island. So if you think you are strong, you've gone wireless, you've got cables, we need you to come to the Devil's Island sometime next year during the Africa Internet Summit, organized by AF Stars, led by Afrinic and the Africa Internet Governance. And you are all invited to this wonderful, coordinated continent that God has blessed. Thank you. Thank you, and that was Nena Nwakama from the Free Software and Open Source Foundation of Africa. And uh, that was a very elaborate uh, summary of uh, tangible examples of enhanced cooperation and the different organizations and stakeholders within the African content. Our next panelist is uh, Oscar Robles from NIC, Mexico. The, and um, he's from the Latin American and Caribbean region, obviously. And uh, welcome, Oscar. Please share your thoughts. Thank you. Um, I will mention some examples of uh, enhanced cooperation. And uh, uh, as, as, I, uh, as I'm from uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, um, I've been involved in some 
regional initiatives like uh, LACNIC creation. Actually, I'm uh, coming here as a LACNIC board member. Um, uh, let, let me tell you the story of uh, uh, that Inez Corporation uh, in the late 90s, and I will tell you later why this is important. Um, in the late 90s, uh, uh, the, the region didn't uh, have a regional IP registry. Uh, it were, there were very few uh, players uh, in that moment. Uh, th there were only academic, uh, academical networks and maybe some CCTLDs that used to be part of the academical networks as well. So um, we tried to, uh, to be part of these regional IP, IP registries uh, in, uh, since the early 90s, but uh, there was no uh, successful, successful efforts until there were several other actors like the uh, ISPs and the telecom operators. Um, so in the late 90s, these um, uh, more diverse uh, players came into, um, uh, into the scene and uh, to the table, and uh, finally we come up with uh, some agreement. And uh, in, the, in 2001, 2002, we got this uh, accreditation with ICANN. So finally we had the uh, regional IP registry. And that's been a part of the um, successful stories in, in the region because uh, LACNIC is not only to have the operational uh, IP allocations in the region. That's uh, one uh, important part of uh, the LACNIC creation, but that's only a small part of the contribution that this regional IP registry has come to the, to the region. Um, we have had a, a lot of um, uh, players into the, uh, these meetings and these forums. And uh, like um, Nena uh, was uh, telling us, uh, we've been, um, witnessed the creation of several other organizations in the region. Uh, these LAC stars, or LAC stars, as uh, the, the um, fellows from Africa. Um, We've been watching and uh, witnessing the uh, creation of uh, LAC TLD as well, uh, the CCTLD's uh, regional organization. Uh, we've, uh, uh, we've been uh, watching the creation of LAC IX, the organization of uh, internet, internet exchange points in the, in the region, that's uh, more recently, uh, LAC NOG, uh, and other efforts uh, like the um, pre-IGF uh, in the region. Um, together, LACNIC has made the effort to bring uh, government actors, government players um, to these meetings. Um, and uh, uh, it's been like 10 years of um, uh, events and 20 events uh, talking about the uh, internet challenges, cu uh, current and future, and that's uh, certainly helped to create a very um, good strength in the region and un an understanding of these uh, issues in uh, different forums, not only the technical community, but also the government uh, officials that, that have uh, attended all these events, the LACNIC events, the LACIX, uh, LACIX events, the uh, regional uh, IGF, etc. So uh, this is just the, the beginning. I think that the, this is a, a, a very um, important um, effort, not only, the, uh, as I was mentioning, the operational IP allocation in the region, but also the, the, the other activities that have come uh, into these um, uh, events. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. What we've clearly heard is, um it, it's very interesting hearing the African content, a context and looking at the AfriStars and the different organizations and clearly Africa is very well coordinated, just like the Latin American Caribbean region. And uh, in terms of, particularly in terms of um, uh, how, they, how they sort of meet uh, annually to discuss uh, strategies in collaboration. It's very interesting to hear Oscar and uh, have him uh, talk about some of the tangible examples like the setting up of LACNIC and the setting up of internet exchange points. Now we're going to dive right into, still in the Latin American Caribbean region, I'm, I have the privilege of introducing Bernadette Lewis from the Caribbean Telecommunications Union. 
and she'll be um, expressing uh, her perspective uh, on enhanced cooperation with a focus on intergovernmental organizations. So Bernadette. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just by way of introduction, I would like to say that this Caribbean Telecommunications Union was established in 1989 to be the, in the policy in, instrument or the policy, policy institution for the telecommunications sector. But given the rapid evolution of technology and the growth of the internet, in, nine, in 2004, we expanded the membership of the Caribbean Telecommunications Union to include private sector organizations, civil society, members of the academic fraternity, in addition to uh, non-traditional, uh, the other Caribbean countries that were not traditionally part of, of, of the Caribbean community. In so doing, we created a multi-stakeholder organization, and that has been uh, very effective in enabling us to do the, our, to, to fulfill our mandate. Um, one of the mandates of the CGU is coordination, and we work with many organizations, many uh, stakeholders, to ensure that, or to encourage pooling of resources, sharing of information, um, making the best use of what the resources that we have available to us. And I'll give you one very, uh, I could give a couple of examples, but certainly one of them is that we started actually sharing our annual agenda with the International Telecommunications Union's Caribbean office. So we share our agendas, we look at, the, at activities that are similar, and we actually blend the activities. So in the area of, of Spectrum, we've recognized the ITU was doing a number of programs in Spectrum, the CTU was doing a number of programs in Spectrum. We've been able to blend the activities so that the when you put them together, they, there's a progression, uh, and you can see a, a thread of development in a particular line. And if we don't do that, um, if we don't attempt to bring organizations together, what you'd have is a, a scattershot of activities that do not bear any reference one with the other. And it does not contribute to meaningful development and meaningful uh, advancement. So in blending agendas with different organizations, we are able to build on the work that is happening and realize a progression that makes sense for the region. I also wanted to point out that it is our perspective is that no single organization can do the work that is necessary if we're going to support uh, the, our member countries in their migration to information societies. So that we work in strategic partnerships and cooperate with many organizations such as LACNIC, Packet Clearing House, ARIN. We have these relationships, these cooperative relationships that enable us to do our work. And we have found that, that by cooperating with these organizations, the quality of our work is enhanced because it represents the broader view of the collective community. And um, this, uh, our philosophy in terms of coordination, we are going to be expanding it with other organizations and sharing and blending agendas so that uh, we make use of, of, of very, the effective use of the limited resources and also that we see a meaningful advancement. So that's it, thank you. Thank you, Bernadette. Uh, next up, we have Musab Abdullah from the Kingdom of Bahrain, who will be sharing Bahrain's experience on uh, effective cooperation. 
Musab. Thank you very much. Um, I'm indeed from the, the, the government of the Kingdom of Bahrain. I'm from the regulator, more specifically. And uh, after those, uh, those, those first speakers, it's going to be a very tough act to follow. Um, the fact of the matter is that regionally, uh, in the Arab region, we actually break down to two broad regional um, groups, if you will. The first is the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, which is uh, Bahrain, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman. And then we have the League of Arab States, which is the 22 Arab countries. Historically, co uh, coordination and cooperation across the region has been strong. And, uh, and we, we've actually reaped the benefits in, in many different areas. So when we come to the topic of internet governance, the fact of the matter is that regionally, in some areas, we, we are perhaps lagging behind a little bit. And that includes some of the, the coordination and the communication between the government organizations and the non-government organizations. To that end, uh, within the last couple of years, the Arab IGF has, has been established to actually f form the platform to, for this enhanced cooperation. That said, it's, it's been a fairly recent phenomenon about the, the need for coordination at the policy level. Generally, countries tend to just um, communicate with each other their, their policy levels, but the, the crux or, or the, um, the focus of the coordination has been primarily at the technical level. And we've, we've actually made excellent inroads and excellent progress, particularly with, for example, our, uh, our relationship with the RIPE NCC, which is our, um, our RIR. And the, the, it has become apparent over the last year or so that there is a need for a little bit of extra effort and work in tying together the diverse elements within the region. So while it is a work in progress, the, f for sure we can say that the, the work is picking up. We're making excellent inroads and uh, hopefully uh, we, we want to be able to coordinate not only within our region but across regions to make sure that, that we leverage each other's experience because ultimately there's no sense in re reworking what, what has already been done. I think I'll, uh, I'll give my other panelists a chance to uh, interject on this now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Musab. Our next panelist is uh, streaming in from Japan, and uh, she is Yuri Ito. She's the director of um, she's the director of global coordination and JAPSIT. And I'm just going to check if the facilities are clear and if she's able to start speaking. Yuri, could you please say hello, just to test? Yes, hello. Can you oh. hear me? Uh, not really. I, if I could ask the guys to turn up the audio a little bit so that the room can hear her. Speak again, Yuri. Yeah, good morning. Can you all hear her? Yes. Okay, go ahead, Yuri. Okay. Hello, good morning. Um, thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry I cannot make it to be there physically. Um, now, I, I was there in the beginning of the week, but now I'm back um, to uh, D.C., so I'm calling in from D.C. Um, my name is Yuri Ito. Um, I plan to make my remarks based on my perspective from what we're doing for the um, cybersecurity operational community, how CERT and the technical community work together in the Asia-Pacific region. And um, hopefully that would uh, contribute to um, how the regional collaboration on the cybersecurity um, area um, is to share how we're doing and um, contribute to the governance um, discussion as well. So today I am specifically representing the um, Chart Collaboration Forum in Asia Pacific region, known as APSOT. Um, Asia Pacific Computer Emergency Response Team. Um, do you have a slide in front of you? Yes, Yuri. Okay, good. So um, I will uh, share how we uh, overcome the challenges and kept um, have kept us closely working together to make the internet cleaner, safer, and reliable space through managing the regional level of cyber risk. 
And just to, um, before I'm starting, just to clarify, when I am talking about saying, make, you know, um, saying cyberspace cleaner and healthier, I am not talking about the content. But I am talking about Internet's technical ecosystem, which consists of Internet infrastructure, such as interconnecting servers and devices. Um, AP Start is focusing on making those devices and you know servers cleaner and healthier. Next slide, please. So this is about the um, general introduction about AP Start. Um, we were established 2003, so it's been 10 years um, since AP Start was established, and we have 26 teams from 19 economies today working together closely with trust. Um, of course, you know, you know, all of you know, doing international collaboration, building trust is not easy. Um, there are, of course, significant differences in political systems and IT infrastructure, culture and language differences. And each team also has different um, authorities. Um, so our remediation approaches in dealing with the incident can be very different. Next slide, please. So this is the list of the um, countries, economies, and the SART teams from those economies. Um, so it's very um, uh, covering from the um, region. I feel we've generally successfully overcome those significant differences and work well together as one big team. Um, and I would like to highlight a couple of key points that have enabled us to achieve that success. Um, which is a common goal, which is to set the common goals in this reduction approach. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I'd like to initially touch upon the evolution of the CERT community, how um, those CERTs started and how international collaboration um, starting. Um, the very fast start is 1989. And 19th to um, early 2000, CERTs were established mostly in places like um, very deep technical expertise, um, like government research center and universities. And then um, CERT or start developing its collaboration forum organically. So the very first um, global co um, collaboration forum is called FIRST, um, which was established in 1990. And then um, the regional, as a regional one, there is TFC CERT, um, which is the first um, regional level of uh, CERT collaboration forum, which was in, established in 2000. Three years later, we have um, AP CERT. Now, globally, other regional initiatives are gaining momentum today, such as Oga Organization of Islamic Cooperation, OIC CERT, um, and Africa CERT is uh, now very actively developing its um, function. Um, and also GCC CERT, um, OAS, these um, each regions have its CERT collaboration forum. Now, over the um, past 20 years, with the evolution of global internet services and, of course, the cyber threat and risk evolved as well, cybersecurity has become a major public safety and national security issues. So, naturally, government have become much more engaged in security operations. So, these national certs have been supplemented, supplemented um, but even supplemented by national security lead operational organizations. Next slide, please. Um, so this is, um, I'm going to touch a little bit about how, what type of challenges we are fa facing. Um, so with the technology and threat continue to rapidly evolve, we start seeing um, targeted attacks are occurring globally, and we see increasing number of clearly national security motivated attacks such as um, Stuxnet and DDoS against governments and banking systems. Now, um, governments are start discussing on cyber war and conflict in places such as this meeting, um, some, some of that meeting. And, um, and around the world, um, governments are making accusations and taking sides and who's conducting attacks and this, uh, creating risks. So quickly managing cyberspace and cybersecurity is being seen as a competition. And that actually challenged um, create the substantial challenges for start in technical community in pursuing um, pursuit of uh, international collaboration. Um, now, but next slide, please. 
AP CERT has turned this challenge to an opportunity. Um, the challenge was, um, of course, this um, competitive approach, the involvement of the national security organizations can, you know, um, potentially break down in trust. Um, start in technical community if we were seen as an instrument of the state focus competition. Um, so it's been, it's getting a little um, difficult, but we, AP thought actually turned this challenge to an opportunity. Um, we work on addressing cybersecurity concerns through many programs, um, such as listing in here, um, annual cybersecurity exercise, cleanup programs, awareness campaign, partnership with the other regional for, um, forums. Um, we're, we are out there in help develop and training capacity building support to the um, other regions and shared network monitoring system and, and so on. We provide trust point of contact hotline, technical hotline between the members. And also we participate in global dialogues on fostering cleanup norms or risk reduction norms, um, including um, we're participating as a guest to uh, APICTEL, um, like a regional forums like APSTAR, APNIC, ASEAN regional forums. And um, we share how we see the situation and challenges and participate the um, international dialogue um, in the region. Next slide, please. Um, so APSUR has established its primary goal in contributing to making the internet ecosystem cleaner and healthier as a basis for improved cybersecurity in the Asia Pacific as a mutual benefit for all parties using cyberspace in long term. Um, we are focused on cleanup malware and cooperate in removing botnets. Um, and with this way, um, we can set the common goal and um, making us, you know, work all together. So I would skip next slide, slide eight, nine, ten, um, going to the page ten. Um, this is, uh, I think, the very important key factor of the successful international collaboration on the um, cybersecurity space. AP sort of has turned its focus from security to regional risk reduction and viewing the cybersecurity challenges as a part of improving the global environment. And we believe we can identify the common goals for mutual benefit for long term, um, in the long term. And I believe such a focus on a healthier, cleaner cyberspace will um, prove the crucial underlining success factor in achieving global cybersecurity collaboration. Um, so we're uh, very keen on collaborating all the stakeholders in the region to make the cyberspace in Asia Pacific safer, cleaner, and more reliable. Um, thank you very much. That's all from, uh, from me to uh, introduce what we're doing and how we um, collaborate. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, you really appreciate your streaming in. And uh, please stay online because we'll be having interactions uh, shortly after. Um, I have the privilege of introducing Sally Costerton of uh, ICANN, who will be talking about some practical uh, experiences from their perspective, Sally. Thank you very much and thank you for inviting me to be part of this group. Um, I lead stakeholder engagement at ICANN uh, around the world and uh, our mission, I think uh, it's fair to say, is ambitious, um, uh, which is to try and work with all our stakeholders around the world, ultimately so that everybody whose lives and work are affected by what ICANN does are, are aware that we exist of their rights and responsibilities and how they can interact with ICANN uh, if, they, if they would like to. And that's very ambitious. Um, we organize it uh, in, <clears throat> globally and regionally. Um, in my experience, implementation really is always regional. I mean, yes, you can build a website globally, but pretty much everything else, as, as somebody said earlier, is in the end done by individuals, by real people in countries collaborating together to solve problems. And much of what we do in ICANN and engagement is about solving problems and about providing different kinds of resource to help groups to do their work. 
That could be money sometimes, so travel support, for example. It could be people, and increasingly it is people, and I'm going to spend a bit more time on that. Um, it could be uh, providing uh, events where we can bring people together uh, and to support many of the organizations that people on this panel represent um, and many of you in the room represent. Um, we've done a lot in this area in the last 12 months. I, I think if I'm honest, um, you know, ICANN has always been very committed to uh, regional engagement and outreach and has established very strong relationships with many major regional organizations that are involved in internet governance of varying different types over the years. Um, but it's really been my privilege in the last year um, to have um, perhaps a greater strategic priority by ICANN's leadership on internationalizing ICANN, by which we mean expanding out of its traditional US footprint, its California mindset, if you will, um, you, some of you may be aware that we have um, expanded into three global hubs. So the hub has been split into three. So we now have Los Angeles supporting North and South America and Canada. We have Istanbul supporting the Europe, Middle East and Africa region. So these are time zone focused. And we have Singapore supporting our Asia Pacific region. So that is three very much about coordination offices there to help to provide support in different areas, compliance, legal, but also things like communications, event management, um, many things that are relevant to the discussions we've had already here this morning. In addition to that, I have working with me at the moment eight um, vice president level engagement leads based all around the world. Um, they are building uh, strong community groups around them in the form of uh, working in very much about, very much about enhanced cooperation, um, building plans uh, in different regional groupings with cross-stakeholder groups, implementation, it, it, really around engagement, around outreach, around capacity building, uh, and the role of the ICANN VP in this is very much about making sure that, as I say, that community can get its work done, trying to help it where it needs help. And of course, representing in many cases um, a very specific remit around the names and numbers portfolio that ICANN very specifically holds. Those eight people, um, are some of them are here. Uh, many of you will know some or all of them. Um, and I hope that uh, if you don't um, and you would like um, to know more about how ICANN engages in your region, um, please either come to me or email me and I can connect you to the right person. Having said that human beings do much of the work, and they do, I think also how they behave is very important. It, this collaboration point is so key. I came out of the corporate world. I've been involved in the internet in ICANN for about 18 months. And one of the things I came in with was some experience in hiring people, in, in looking for the very best talent. And in this world, we are looking for people with a very collaborative mindset who have very good emotional intelligence, you know, who can empathize with what other people need. And they do not have an arrogant, selfish perspective. And this is very key, and this has been very important in terms of my thinking and our thinking, and that of our CEO, Fadi Shahadi, who I imagine most of you have seen in action this week. He's hard to miss. Um, in terms of bringing together that group with, with, a, with a very... Um, strong mission to be supportive and to be helpful. Um, <clears throat> we have expanded our, our uh, not just the, the, the regional working groups across those four key audience groups, government, civil society, the technical community, and uh, uh, the academic community, but also coordinating, as, as you've mentioned on this panel already, at a regional layer um, with the existing, many existing regional groups that are, that are represented here. Um, and I hope that we are opening the doors to ICANN in, in a way we are inviting people to, to come in. Um, I'm trying very hard to make our resources as available um, and as understandable to as many in the community as I can. 
And I'm happy to say that I've experienced and my team experienced tremendous partnership in this community, a tremendous shared ambition to improve the, the way in which we collectively um, try to solve these complex problems in the internet governance space of how we manage this precious shared resource. It's very challenging, um, but I think we're making great progress. Um, at a, in a wider remit, the, the uh, broader challenge that also faces us is how do we manage the expansion of our community? Um, both the ICANN-specific uh, community and our broader internet community. And that is both with people, but also with tools and platforms. And I would ask if any of you haven't and you're interested in this, we are running some very pioneering web development uh, spaces called under a brand, well, a, 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 a web area called ICANN Labs. And if you're interested in um, that kind of area, please do go and have a look at ICANN Labs. So in summary, I would say um, very much a focus on people in the regions, working in partnership every day with the groups, uh, investment in tools and resources, um, and always a, a, sh a shared goal of um, expanding how we communicate and how we, how we help new people to come in to understand how to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. We've heard from the panelists that uh, the diverse stakeholders that make up the internet universe, so the internet ecosystem, uh, have different uh, contexts, diverse contexts. And the challenge for enhanced cooperation uh, is there. And in fact, some of the challenges that some of the panelists have identified are issues of language, diversity, uh, issues of uh, functionality, uh, issues of funding. And one of the things that we've heard clearly is um, the setting of common goals, particularly in terms of the context of development. We heard from Bernadette as she spoke that the lack of collaboration or the lack of enhanced cooperation essentially uh, would, could skew development. And in regions in the world where resources are constrained, it makes complete sense uh, for there to be uh, effective and aggressive collaboration. And it was very interesting to hear from Yuri as she talked about some of the, the things that they've had to deal with over the last 10 years, particularly in terms of uh, looking for opportunities uh, for collaboration. And one of the interesting things that uh, Sally brought out in her uh, discussion with us was the issue of uh, reforms, uh, institutional reforms to cater for uh, this sort of enhanced collaboration, particularly in terms of being more accessible. And there was something that Sally raised which, which was very, very interesting. She mentioned that, uh, that they, they were very keen on hiring people that were not arrogant, that were not selfish, that had a desire to collaborate. And that brings about uh, concepts and attitudes, and it talks about the approach that stakeholders must engage with, coming, uh, coming with the desire to collaborate, coming with the desire to uh, step back and to say that I am willing to compromise on certain things. Uh, and that was a very, very interesting uh, point that Sally raised. So with that, we would like to invite you, uh, those of you who are in the workshop uh, today, to feel free to uh, share your thoughts. So if you would like to comment, uh, feel free to do that as well. And any of the panelists, if you feel like responding to any of your fellow panelists, please do so. The floor is open. Yes, please, gentlemen there. Please introduce yourself for the transcripts. And Thank you very much. Um, my name is uh, Khaled Fouda. I am responsible for ICT uh, development within the Arab Legion at uh, the League of Arab States. And actually, uh, I totally agree with you about uh, the importance of setting a common goal. Uh, we've been working on, uh, on, multi, on a multi-stakeholder uh, model for uh, Arab uh, internet governance within the region. Uh, as Mossab uh, mentioned, we are working on an IXP pr project, we are working on Arab uh, top-level domains, we are working on uh, in, 
on initiating uh, a parallel track to the Arab IGF uh, for enhanced cooperation. Uh, and it's uh, sort of actually a new, a, a new model for us, uh, for the League of Arab States, to work in such an, a multi-stakeholder environment. But I totally agree upon the importance of setting a common goal. I believe that uh, this IGF is too much focused on the process and procedures, and the product is never mentioned. So I believe if we talk more about the product, about what are we trying to do, maybe then we will reach uh, to a better comprehension of what's the process that we need for multi-stakeholder uh, cooperation. Thank you very much. Very much. Excellent point. And I think Nena would like to respond. Nena? Yeah. Jumping on from there, there's a lady who is seated, second person on your left. Her name is Anna Rachel Ine. I think she's been through the halls and the windows and the pathways of this. That's the lady seated there. She's the one who invited me to the Africa Internet Summit in Zambia. And what I learned from there is the answer to a question that someone was asking today. Should policy people go to technical meetings? And should tech people go to policy meetings? And the answer is a definite yes. And that's the only way we can come out of this. Because in my head, I've always said, no, I don't do names and numbers. I won't do names and numbers. I repeat to myself, I look at myself in the mirror, I say, Nena, you shall not do names and numbers. But we cannot move forward if policy people like me don't come and sit and do names and numbers, and people who do names and numbers can come and sit at the boring, therefore shall, must, will, shall endeavor kind of meetings. So we need to go through all of that torture to come to a balance. And the small story is that while I was at the Africa Internet Summit, the people of the CERT, the, the Cote d'Ivoire CERT, people were supposed to come in and do um, a presentation on the computer readings, and they could not come. And they're like, oh, Nena, since you are there, we are going to give you our presentation. And so look at me. I'm standing in front of the CERT guys doing a presentation of Cote d'Ivoire CERT. And I was saying, I don't do names and numbers. So you cannot, uh, in this arena, say, I'm a policy person, I'm a names person, I'm a numbers person, or I'm a kind of this person. We must be willing, personally, individually, to cross that bridge, to cross that um, professional bridge, not to be afraid to go into the business meeting and see how the DNS business works. DNS people should not be too bored to sit in the policy meeting and debate will and shall and must. And the shall and must people should also sit and know how IPv6 and IPv4 works. That is, I believe, the only way we can move forward. Otherwise, we shall remain in silos and speak to ourselves. Thanks. Thank you, Nena. We're hearing that um, in terms of uh, the tendency to or the temptation to work in silos, but encouraging or, or encouraging the, the capacity and enhancing the capacity to come out of it and to go into new territory, maybe territory that's foreign uh, to us. And it, that's very, very interesting because some of the workshops that have been uh, happening the, through the past few days have actually been touching on some of those uh, potential conflicts. There's a lady. Yes, please, go ahead. Hello. If you could introduce yourself for the transcripts, please. Sure. My name is Beatrice Lasnemope. I'm here from the Communications Commission of Kenya. But I'm asking this question on a personal level, not necessarily the views of the Commission. My question is, most of these meetings, like uh, my African sister mentioned, focuses a lot on policy and a lot of on, on the technical aspect. So my question is, would the organizations or the multi-stakeholders consider involving the business end? Because from my perception, there's a lot of the technical involvement in the multi-stakeholders. You have institutions, you have governments, you have maybe regulators, 
but in the business world, if, if someone is not in academics and they are not interested in technology, it's very hard to know what these organizations do, what this governance is. And in as much as we have a lot of organizations in Africa, I don't see the knowledge within the meetings and the groups tickling down to an everyday member of the community. Is there a way, maybe moving forward, we can incorporate other people outside of our strict organization, the institutions, the governments, and maybe a few uh, academic institutions? Thank you, Beatrice. The, the issues that was raised was whether there was private sector involvement in terms of uh, development and synergistic initiatives. I think that question would be best answered by somebody from the private sector. Mr. Pedrazo, who's sitting right there, would you like to answer for Verisign uh, on some of your Thank you, Sally. Um, synergistic initiatives? Uh, thank you for so much um, for this opportunity. In, in fact, I'm more acting um, uh, as a MAG member uh, instead of uh, the very sign. And I, um, I just want to also acknowledge the the, uh, the incredible opportunity of this uh, panel in terms of sharing experience of uh, in collaboration between uh, different uh, organizations around uh, uh, some, some kind of outreach to the different communities. Um, in fact, I have, this uh, year I have been facilitating uh, during the event the dialogue between interregional and, uh, uh, and the global IGF. And in this sense, three sessions has been uh, uh, planned. Two of them have been completed, and the last one will be held this this afternoon at, at 4:30. But uh, I just want to make the point is that uh, here in the panelists, you realize that it's not only the linkage between uh, the local and the regional needs uh, with a global organization and the global IGF, but instead, as as Bernard Dets had mentioned, it's interesting to see the collaboration between these different organizations uh, that have uh, s that have complementary agendas to uh, solve or to uh, support the needs of uh, of some countries of some regions of some groups um, I have uh, at some point in of time uh, the opportunity to to attend the first uh, Pacific IGF with the company of Sala, and it was impressive to, to realize uh, how different the, the, the needs they have compared to other regions. I have also the opportunity to compare with uh, when I was uh, attending the European IGF, the Asia Pacific IGF, uh, the Caribbean IGF, or the Latin American IGF. Uh, and, and you realize uh, that you have to get a deep understanding of what uh, are the, not only the local needs, but uh, to understand also the culture, the people involved, and, and how to collaboratively uh, respond to those needs. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. Uh, Bernadette, if there's anyone else who wants to speak, yeah. can I see your hand so I can take a sequence? One, two. Okay, so we'll go one, two, three, four, five. Bernadette, please. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to point out to some of the initiatives that the CTU undertakes on a routine basis, fairly often. Um, we have awareness building uh, activities that are designed for different communities in language that is comprehensible to them. And in addition, we do ministerial fora where you have the business community, you have regulators, you have people from the academic fraternity, and the rule is that you don't use any technical jargon, but you speak in language that is comprehensible to the various stakeholders. And this has been very, very effective 
in bringing diverse perspectives together and bringing diverse players together to speak on issues that are of importance to them. You cannot do ICT policy or internet policy without some input from the business community, without input from policymakers and regulators. All stakeholders really, really need to be involved. So there is an, a requirement of raising or, or reaching out and providing the education and the public awareness that is necessary to enable different start stakeholders to participate in the discussion on a particular topic. Thank you, Bernadette. Just before we go back to the panelists who want to respond, can I just see the hands from the floor? Yes, please go ahead, sir, and then give over your next. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Hisham. Uh, I come from uh, Egypt. I'm involved with the Arab IGF Secretariat, and I work for the uh, National Telecom Regulatory Authority. Um, actually, I, I, I have two, uh, two ideas that I, I thought uh, worth sharing with the, with the audience. Um, hearing the different initiatives and being involved in, in some of these, actually, as well, uh, I think the challenge is not just to, to make coordination happen, but to make coordination meaningful. And to make the coordination efforts meaningful, uh, one has to think of uh, institutionalizing the, the initiatives and the different efforts. Uh, three words actually comes to mind uh, when we speak about this. Uh, having uh, well thought processes is one. Uh, being inclusive, uh, especially uh, uh, to the right people, because being inclusive is not just keeping the door open, but also outreaching to the right people. And of course, building trust through, uh, through the processes and being inclusive. Uh, by, by combining these three things, I think uh, one could reach an, a meaningful coordination effort at the regional level. Uh, speaking now as uh, coming from, an, uh, from a government agency, uh, also all these initiatives and all these organizations working uh, at different levels uh, Nena has mentioned uh, a big list of uh, uh, entities in Africa, another uh, list uh, mentioned by my colleague Khaled in uh, the Arab region. Uh, there is a pressure on all our agencies and our companies in terms of institutional capacities. Uh, not one entity can cover all aspects. One benefit of coordination at the regional level is to actually mobilize expertise from different entities in the region who have the similar uh, circumstances, so it's, it's really worth the effort. Thank you very much. Very excellent points. Kivuva? Uh, I'm Kivuva Mwendwa Kivuva from Kenya. I, I'm here as an Internet Society Ambassador. My contribution was that multi-stakeholderism can be more enhanced through legislation by passing laws either in the regional levels or at the local parliaments. Uh, a good example is my country, Kenya, that has a constitution that adheres to most the multi-stakeholderism model. And the president himself, actually, he insists that all stakeholders have to be involved. If there is to be support from the top, is when this model can actually work best, not just as a talk shop, but where there, there can actually be an effect on society. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kivuva. What we're hearing is uh, political will. Is that what you're saying? High-level political will from the top down. So, Sintra, would you like to... Uh... Thank you, Salah. My name is Sintra Suknanan. I'm from Trinidad and Tobago. And uh, in our region, the Latin American and Caribbean region, um, there's a wide range of, of countries and, and interests. Um, you have countries like Brazil partnered with Caribbean, small Caribbean islands like Haiti. I want to ask the panelists, um, how do you feel regional coordination um, facilitates um, specific um, communities of interest rather than just by regional um, groupings but also in terms of small island developing state interests, for instance. S 
Sally, would you like to answer that? Sorry, just the last part of the question. Would you mind repeating it? Sure. So I'd like to know how you manage to coordinate both on a level that is regional, but also that enhances um, alignment with communities of interest. Thank you. Um, I think you make a really good point. Um, it's, a, it's a very um, perceptive question. Um, because when we think about what we need to, um, I was going to say to get out of these engagements, this is not quite the right word, but we talk a lot about what we put in and how we collaborate and how we share. But in the end, all of our communities want specific things to help them to be successful as well. It's a two-way process. Um, I think at a, at a, my answer to you is I think it depends by region, um, and depending on the individuals that are involved. But certainly, um, I would like to see, and I would love ICANN to do everything it can to help this process, much better sharing of what in the corporate world we call best practice. So there are communities of interest who may be across different regions, but who really need to connect with each other, and who can help each other much more quickly if we join people together. And I think we need to think more creatively about how we do that outside the traditional kind of functional silos, as somebody was talking earlier, you know, policy, technical community, these are very well established. But if we're trying to have people um, get together, for, ex for example, uh, ICANN has this today, f News Flash, has put the first four um, new IDN top level domains, global top level domains, into the root. This is today. And this is a historic thing. Now, many of, <laughs> thank you. M many of the IDN, the international domain name applicants, want those domains to protect communities by language um, or, or by a, a cultural affiliation um, around the world. So I don't think the answer is always build a domain, a top level domain, but I think encouraging ourselves to think more creatively about how to support communities by interest um, is, is, is something we, we, should, we should really listen and take that on board. Thank you, Sally, Nena, and then Oscar. Okay, thanks. I was thinking of your question and I'm like, communities of interest, are the same ones that are called stakeholders today. It's just that within the framework of WESIS, there are three bodies of stakeholders. It used to be three, but now we're going gently into four or even five. So for island states, you still need to constitute a stakeholder group. It may not be when they are counting stakeholder groups, because when we come to these IGF meetings, the main things do not happen during the panels and the sessions. They happen in between the panels and outside of the walls. So you still need that stakeholder group to pursue your own interests. But linking that now to the question British was asking about the business group, um, someone was saying yesterday, and that rightly, that business is wired to do 90% results, 10% process. What is it you have to do? That is the easiest part of business. And then you go ahead and achieve it and make the money. That is how business does. But government is not wired that way. And civil society is, will not be wired that way. But what we'll, we're looking at the digital economy in which we're not just stuck in one stakeholder group alone. I come here as civil society, and many people, when they see me, they see civil society, but act, I actually run a business. And my next client for whom I'm rolling out a training is the Economic Commission for West African States. Yesterday night, while I left here, I was sending out my pro forma invoices. I, I travel with my stamp, I travel with my checkbook, I'm ready to work, I'm ready to bill anybody anytime. That's business for me, okay? So what, what I'm saying is I cannot 
quarter myself in the business attitude. I'm going anywhere where my business interest is and policy people give me business. So the thing is, we cannot make a business of the internet, make a business with the internet without understanding how it works, without understanding how business is made out of it. So business people cannot sit and wait to be invited. No, you have to come and understand how this works. And finally, I want to say that there are pure internet businesses now. Um, there's a gentleman who was seated here, I don't know if he's left, he's Adiel of Afrenic. There's a whole DNS business boom. So will DNS business guys sit and say, no, um, names and numbers are technical group and not business issues? No. I myself, I always keep an eye on business initiatives. I'm going to buy some stuff in bulk and sell them later, trust me. So if I'm hanging around here telling you I'm a civil society person, don't kid with me, I'm here for business. So when you go back to Kenya, tell Kenya business guys that we, we talk in IGF, but later on when we move back, some checks are signed, so they need to come around. Wow. Kenya has been touted to be the Silicon Valley of Africa. Oh, it is. Okay, it is. Thank you. Please allow me to answer that. Thank you for your information. When I please ask, say your name before my name is Beatrice Ope, and I am from Kenya. And um, I am very thankful for the information you've given. However, there is some miscommunication in understanding the problem. The problem is not that Kenyans don't have entrepreneurs. We are, we have entrepreneurs. I was asking the question at a personal level. I'm a policy person and I'm also a technical person. So that it's not an option of this or either. This was a very general question. And the question was, in our information, how do you attract people who don't come to these meetings? I'm not talking about the youth in our society who are already here and they're making business aspects out of it. I was asking the question in relation to the entrepreneurs who are out there and they're not in the mainstream, mainstream and they're not interested in govern, governance or internet governance per se. So how do you translate our language to theirs? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Beatrice. The numerous examples across the different regions of cross-collaborative initiatives uh, where you have ICT business incubators and um, but for now, Musab would like to... Uh... Thank, you, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll touch on a couple of things. I want to tie together a few different points, but uh, I'll start and I'll lead up eventually to answering your question about how to engage them. One of the things that I think is vitally important is that there's clear re representation of the different interests. You know, Because we, we keep talking about the stakeholders and the stakeholders, but our, let, let's say we have a stakeholder from uh, civil society. Do they necessarily represent all civil societies or their civil society? Likewise government, likewise business. So the, the clear and uh, representation of this is, is how we're going to get all, all these viewpoints put into the pot and in order to make a decision. Which, which leads me to the term enhanced cooperation. As, uh, as, as my colleague uh, Hisham said, it's essentially, what we're looking for is meaningful um, coordination here, okay? And meaningful coordination is effective, it's streamlined, and in pretty much all cases, it's about reducing noise. There's, we, we live in a day and age where there's such a glut of information that it's hard to sift the, the, the jewels from the dross, you know, the, the good from the, from the meaningless. And when you get that, you get clarity. And I think that's a big part of how you engage people, because we've heard now about how technical people don't understand the policy side, and policy people don't understand the technical side. Well, part of the problem is there's just so much for them to go through, there's so much for them to absorb. And likewise, when you come to the layperson, when you come to your average citizen who has concerns, who has a viewpoint to share, they're not sure where to go with it. So I think that's perhaps reducing noise and being clear on where we're going might be the, the best way to go forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Musab. Just before I summarize uh, today's discussions, 
Adele, can you do it in two minutes? And Oscar, two minutes. I just want to maybe stress on the <clears throat> involvement of all stakeholders, especially business. Uh, in, in our region, it is, it, is a, it is an issue. It's an issue globally, but more specifically in our region for a for few reasons. We have tried to look at this. Uh, this. <clears throat> the first thing is that um, uh, getting interest in Internet governance means that your business has some aspect of globality. Most of the business involved in the internet in our region are still have a very local scope. So the first thing is how do we make sure that there is a relay in each of those countries about the relevance of the internet governance, the global internet governance uh, locally. So how by thinking global we can apply those things local. Who can be the relay? We have a few examples on that on how uh, sometimes policymakers, instead of trying to be the one who define policy, relay the message of the global policy locally so to make it relevant to business. That is, <clears throat> that is, that is one, one thing. And naturally, when the business or, or, or internet industry in, in developing country will go global, they will get involved in the global internet governance issue because they will see the impact directly on them. I will give a very simple example. A few years ago, we have been approached by a policymaker from Nigeria about you know, several issues about IP addresses, um, uh, where local businesses were giving a different message to policymakers about IP address. We took time to explain to the policymakers what we do and who define our policy. It is business. It is the operator who define our policy. But they didn't give that message to the policymaker. By talking to the policymaker, policymakers were able to send that message, to, to, to elaborate that message to their business and make them get involved in the policy development process so that they, they know how to get IP address, how to register the number, how to make the, the job more easy for the policymaker. There has been no change in the multi-stakeholder process, but it has been about information. So how do we relay the global issue about internet governance locally? That is the issue, and everybody has a responsibility on that. Thank you, Adele. I've been told that we have uh, 13 minutes, so there is time for people to make comments, but to allow for people to, uh, to make their comments, we'd ask that you'd keep it to two minutes. But before that, Oscar, please. Thank you. Just uh, let me briefly react to the um, suggestion that legislation is needed uh, uh, in order to uh, improve the multi-stakeholderism uh, in the countries. I understand that uh, there's no need for legislation, actually, but the, we just need willingness from the government. And we have to be very careful because uh, multi-stakeholderism is a very complex issue for governments. They, they are not used to uh, consult uh, uh, other areas or everybody in, in order to, to uh, uh, execute or to do some action. Um, uh, they wasn't teach, uh, uh, they were not teach to um, um, to uh, make these consultations broadly. They, I mean, most of the decisions that the governments uh, um, have to make are done within the government. So uh, this is a, a very complex process, and rather than an, an awareness process, uh, rather than a uh, single act like the legislation. And that's only one part of the equation. The other part of the equation is that uh, the rest of the community, the business, the civil society, uh, academy, and all these uh, organizations, we need to understand the challenges uh, of every discussion that we uh, are uh, holding. Uh, it is not only about technical parameters or names or just numbers. It is about many issues that we have to consider, and uh, uh, we have to be taught on, on these issues as well. It is not only the government to understand the multi-stakeholderism. It is on, also about us to understand that it is not all, only the, tec the technical discussions. It is not anymore technical discussions. So, uh, and that's where I think that a contribution like, like Nick uh, has helped to improve the, the, the level of uh, discussions. Uh, putting together in a single space in these meetings uh, people from governments,
people from the academia, from the uh, technical side, uh, in order to uh, share these uh, experiences. But of course, it, it has to be brought to the local level to actually do uh, actions and execute uh, local strategies, not uh, staying at the dialogue level only. But that's something that has to do and has to happen at the local level. Thank you, Oscar. I'd also like to add that uh, clearly what's been coming out apart from having the need for common goals, the need for common language, but something that has to take place well before that is the need to have clear vision. And clearly, for there to be a clear vision, there has to be a shared vision of what it is that you want to, to build, particularly in terms of uh, identifying goals and laying objectives. And so despite, despite the different interests, despite the different stakeholder groups, despite the diversity of expression, uh, despite the different challenges, whether it's language, geographical distribution, different functionalities, ge different scope, but having a clear vision makes people, um, allows for uh, a coordinated approach in terms of how people are going to engage. And that came across really clearly from the panelists' uh, discussions and also from interactions from the floor. And it, in a context where we're at a juncture where people are questioning, can, is there enhanced cooperation? Can it be done? Here we have panelists saying that it is being done, it has been done, it's being in the process of uh, ever since the internet uh, community uh, has been in existence, there has been aggressive enhanced cooperation across the regions all over the world. You have internet exchange points scattered across uh, the, the world. You have uh, policy collaboration uh, taking place at multiple levels, diverse forums and whatnot. So the challenge for our community is how do we share these lessons and these experiences? So I'm happy to advise that we will be putting together a report. Uh, Mr. Yemen uh, Valdez of uh, NRO uh, will be consolidating a report of today's discussions. Now, if you feel that there are things you would like to add to the dialogue, even though we have limited time here, please feel free to email him your comments, your contributions, and share your experiences from your countries, from your communities, from your organizations, so we can celebrate these experiences. And does anyone want to have any last word before we wrap up? Uh, today's discussion. Any of the panelists? Sally? Thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say one last word, I think, on the question of how do we widen business engagement. And I don't think it's just business, by the way. I think it's users. Um, I think it's and what sometimes you hear people refer to as normal people. <laughs> and I think, I, I think the idea that this, for, this is the biggest challenge that I face in my job, my day job. Honestly, um, how do we go and find the people that we need who, who do need us, they just don't know that they do yet? And one of the biggest challenges is, how do, is that, is how do we make it compelling and relevant so that they come to the table? Because governments, the, the multi-stakeholder model relies on more um, voices, um, more people insisting that they have their seat, um, influence in their governments um, in order to be truly successful. So this is not a nice to have in my view. This is, this is a must have, not just for ICANN, but for the, for the health of the model as we, as we move forward. But I feel quite positive that, that uh, this room probably shares that sentiment. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. And w the point that Adele made neatly wraps up um, our discussions for today when he said it's important to communicate and the power of information and coordination and all of the things that were shared today. And this workshop would not have been possible without uh, the excellent assistance of the NRO staff and we, we thank uh, Yemen and the team, those who are facilitating the remote moderation. We also thank the logistics staff at the back there. Could you give them a hand, please? for facilitating the moderation, and we also thank those who are trans uh, translating uh, the discussions. And not to forget our panelists who's remotely streaming in sacrifice sleep, uh, sacrificing sleep time. Give her a hand. Thank you, Yuri.
And also thank you panelists for a wonderful time. And with that, our workshop is now concluded. Thank you.